today we're talking to uh, a company that has gone above and beyond um, in terms of what they want to do in their properties. Commonwealth partners have a deep commitment to their ESG framework. Um, they have they committed in 2014 to reduce their consumption and emissions by 20%. Fast forward to 2019, last year, when they received USGBC's Leadership Award and recognition from Greg. Jessica has led this effort over the last five years. Uh, she's the Director of Sustainability, and you see her in yellow on my screen. Um, I have learned a lot working with Jessica uh, in this time. Um, she's really a pragmatic and innovative leader that finds opportunities in every single building, in every single environmental metric. I'm thrilled that she can share some of her lessons learned, challenges and opportunities uh, with us today. Uh, so with that, let me pass it to Jessica to tell us a little bit more about her role and uh, the Commonwealth portfolio. Well, I am located in uh, Berkeley, California, which is considered the East Bay to San Francisco, um, known for our Mediterranean climate and the Golden State Warriors basketball team. Uh, we're pretty close to the beach, and um, but not too far to the snow and wine country. And my family and I love to go to the dog beach and can't wait to do that again. Today, um, I would like to talk to you about uh, Commonwealth Partners and how we have been able to establish a program uh, to build on every year. And so Commonwealth Partners, to step back, is a privately owned real estate development management organization who owns and manages multi-tenant office towers throughout the major metropolitan area and totals over 10 million square feet and around 27,000 building occupants um, that come to work each day. And one thing to note is I actually, we usually only look at uh, percentages on leased uh, spaces, but by utilizing ARC, I actually was able to compile the total number of occupants, which is kind of a neat uh, feature. Um, and if you just see in the bar below, those, this is kind of a snapshot of reporting programs that we focus our efforts on each, uh, for each of the managed assets. And I'll go into detail on that a little bit later. Uh, these are our properties, and we're proud to say that um, these properties are all LEED certified, and um, we, we perform manual, uh, annual recertification through ARC. So we originally uh, did through EVON, and for most of them, some of them actually, towards the end, we actually have done um, through ARC uh, certification as well. And I'll kind of go into detail about that as well. First, I just want to take an even further step back and kind of give you an idea of how a, a ESG program works. So to dive a little deeper, to understand our sustainability program, um, I operate as a director of sustainability for Commonwealth Partners since 2014, and I, as a contractor through Verdani Partners, which is my parent firm, uh, which provides uh, portfolio-wide ESG programs, and our ESG management uh, team assists in providing all the applicable uh, vendors and things like utility automation, energy monitoring software, and various reporting programs and tools to main, maintain those uh, well-functioning sustainability program year over year. And then we're tracking progress and making sure new initiatives uh, happen each year. So here, uh, as we look back in, on the progress we've made in 2019, uh, CWP is our continued 100% LEED certified. Um, most recently, we achieved Energy Star Partner of the Year Award for Sustained Excellence. And uh, like Gostini mentioned, uh, CWP achieved the USGBC Leadership Award at Greenbelt in Atlanta, uh, which we were really proud of. And we also ranked first in the office sector for GREZ, which is uh, Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmarking and achieved the regional award and the sustainability leadership. We're particularly proud of all of the assets, not only having 100% lead certification, but 
uh, through those efficiency improvements um, that we track year over year and, and keep pushing the envelope, but that uh, we've been able to achieve a 63% lead platinum uh, through existing buildings, which is pretty, uh, pretty neat. And we're proud of our steady improvement year over year. So we, we didn't start out um, with all these things. We, year over year, we kept adding on to it. Uh, and it's not only the environmental level, but also the social level. Um, and as you know, in real estate industry, um, with buying and selling properties, our percentages are going to just continue to fluctuate. And so, but I will always go back to just start with that one building, build from there, and achieve a high performance portfolio um, towards that 100% lead certification. So what I want to do is sort of give you steps on how do you implement a program? How does ARC uh, get involved within that sustainability program? So my step one, I'm going to give you four, is you got to come up with some goals. And what are those goals? So I, I want to focus um, with this presentation about emissions. And uh, so when you, if you start watching all of the, the sessions that got to me uh, identified, there'll be different sections. Uh, for me, we're going to focus on emissions. And that's a, a goal of ours to uh, focus on. So you see here we reduced, we, we set a goal to reduce emissions, energy, and water by 20% by 2020 using a 2013 baseline and then a waste day version of 75% using that same baseline. And then for our 2030 goals, uh, we are we have a renewable energy by 75% by 2030 and then 30% reduction uh, in emissions. Um, and we'll kind of go into that. So. Uh, the Department of Energy Better Building Challenge, they're uh, a member, we're a member with the, the Building Alliance, and we set these targets back in 2013. So they helped us establish what were the targets that we needed. How do you find targets without um, knowing? So we work with various organizations, and, and so far we've increased, um, we've made sure that our, our reduction or increased targets are on a steady um, Line, and we've had about 3% uh, each year, which is great. But with those goals, how do you find that pathway? How, okay, we have a goal now, but how do we implement it? Um, and so we got to find the path. So that's my step two. So there's two, two ways. There's one, your local or national uh, program. So depending on the state that you're located, there's going to be benchmarking requirements. And, and so finding that, uh, and you have to follow those guidelines. So um, that's one option. And then the other option is, is those nationally recognized programs uh, that are throughout and start utilizing those, those platforms to help you uh, guide your portfolio on what to do. So you can start with that one property and stick with that and then continue adding on and so even if there is a property that may not have a requirement that's in a local, you're still using it as a portfolio-wide requirement. So that way we show consistency that we care about um, our properties no matter where they are. But then I always think back of, okay, how are we gonna be able to make those reductions that we want? And so we really have to step back again and say, what can we control? because it can get kind of overwhelming with the amount of options out there and the different programs and uh, what do you do and all those different limitations. So if you think about for us as a, a property owner um, who's maybe not paying the utilities for their use for their tenants, um, how can we encourage them to reduce energy? So that, that's a legitimate question. Uh, but if we know the whole building data, um, we can determine where the utility is coming from. There's control in that. Um, for transportation, we may not be able to tell the tenants how to get to work, and, but there can be incentives with bike lockers and showers available uh, that can help with the reduction there. For waste, there's a lot of emissions 
um, that's generated when taking off site. So can we strategize how to reduce the waste overall? Um, and then finally, can we come up with greenhouse gas inventory management plan, um, which sounds like a real page turner, I know, but that's kind of our roadmap that's going to help us figure out where uh, our next steps would be. So one of the first ones uh, when we're talking about emissions that we went through in 2018 was the science-based targets, and that's a nationally, uh, internationally recognized um, platform where we really had to dive deep uh, to understand where our emissions were coming from into these three scopes. And it took about a year and a half to go through the application. It wasn't a quick, uh, quick thing at all. And so really we were looking at where, again, what can we control? What were the emissions that, that we know that we have? Uh, so one, scope one is gonna be your fuel, scope two is your electricity, and scope three is all of these different things. And really you have to go through each of these to identify, do we have any control on any of these categories? And that's sort of a, the hard part to understand. Uh, what area can we uh, move forward with? And so we determine based on the, uh, where we're at and having those, those goals to have a 50% uh, reduction uh, for scope one and two. So with scope three, since uh, this particular portfolio doesn't do a lot of um, any new construction to so that extra con uh, you know, construction material, you find that in scope three, but the amount of scope three that we had was inconsequential that um, we don't have to report on it, yet we still do try to reduce. So another item that we've also worked on is uh, the sustainable development goals. And this, is, uh, this reporting is very much an internal process. So it's not something that you're trying to get uh, you know, recognition through or anything like that. This is really to help guide where are your goals. Um, they have specific goals here, and I'm only showing the ones that are um, that I felt were, were specific enough to emissions, uh, since that's our focus for today. So one would be uh, affordable and clean energy. So we have our goals of reducing energy use, uh, providing renewable and clean energy, uh, number nine is industry innovation and infrastructure. So that's, you know, tracking in our energy start, having a portfolio-wide energy monitoring system. So that way we can identify um, when is the demand, when are we hitting our, our peak demand? Can we make changes quickly to ensure that we don't have dirty power coming up onto the grid? Um, so implementing a green leaf language um, was something that we also implemented. And then energy audits. Um, having goals to make sure that we're keeping an eye and a pulse on what's going on in the properties. These are not all new properties. Um, they're older and need, they need care. Uh, the, number 13 is climate action, which obviously is more kind of um, emissions-based, and we show our, you know, our goals within that. And then 17 is partnerships for the goals. So I would consider that as all the different programs that we work with GREZ and CDP and LEED and um, Energy Star, all of that comes into play. So this, again, is just our own roadmap on how to um, move forward. So my step three is now we have to implement the program. We've, we have a goal, we have a pathway, now we have to implement it. And um, that can be a challenge too. So we, look at tenant programs that we can implement. So we're looking at what we can control. Green lease language, we provide a, a green tenant guide, uh, any kind of tenant improvements, we also have a guide. And a lot of times the Cal Green, the Title 24 for California is a, a more stringent um, building code. And so a lot of times we, we try it with our guides and policies, we actually um, see that and try to implement it across the board. But with our different programs we have, we have kind of internal versus external um, and how we create those webinars, education webinars, lobby events, what can be uh, kind of interactive and fun. So 
how does this come into play with ARC? Here we are. So we, you know, with buying and selling, we've inherited some properties and um, started fresh with others. And so what we've done is we started right at the beginning. We were an early adopter with ARC and started out identifying it. So we actually do the annual recertification and um, we're transitioning now. It's going into every three years. But um, over the last few years, we've done every single year certification. And so we, we, uh, when you enter in a property, you can combine it into a portfolio. So then you turn it into a Commonwealth Partners portfolio. And so then it rolls up all the information. So you can see, um, I'm only showing the carbon part, but the projects, it'll show your scores and then carbon. And so it actually shows annual emissions, emissions per occupant, if, um, you know, to sort of drill it down a little bit further. And then it actually shows our scope one, our scope two, and um, it actually shows the annual transportation, which I would consider part of scope three, which is really a neat uh, portion for us to, to identify and see. And you can see in this table here, you have the scope one's light and then two uh, a little darker, and then the darkest is the transportation. And you can see the ones that I haven't done um, that means that it's been over 12 months since our last transportation survey, which is probably going to be a little bit of time before that happens again, if, since we don't have people in the building. So we're sort of identifying what to do about that. Um, but with this, it gives us a better understanding of, of where we can look. So in this particular slide, I'm drilling down a little bit further on the type of mode of transportation. So uh, what's the most common in our portfolio? And is there a strategy that would work better to assist uh, with better transportation habits? So we have one property that provides a free shuttle service uh, from the main train station to the property in the morning and the afternoon to encourage folks to limit solar car rides. Um, we do have in nearly every property, we've got our, our bike storage locations that's secure. Uh, and then we have EV charging stations. Uh, but here too, if you think about EV charging stations, those require electricity to charge those vehicles. So we also want to look at where is the electricity coming from to make sure that we're still helping to make a solution uh, with those new uh, programs. So as we break it down, clearly we know which, prop, which scope we need to focus on. Um, it's the electricity. So what we decided to do was um, identify the renewable energy uh, that we have. So this could be uh, looking at the existing utility company's power mix. Uh, where does electricity come from? From there, we're gonna begin evaluating what alternative energy options there are out there um, through the utility and beyond. So this part is going to take a long time. It's, um, but it's, with this, Going through utility, green power programs, REC, um, existing power mix. For 2019, uh, here we can see that 63% of um, all electricity is renewable, which is pretty cool. So we're getting there, we're getting close to our, our goal. Um, and it's just by seeing, you know, just you can't manage what you don't measure. So breaking it down in this way helps us understand um, a little bit better. Now we want to communicate these results that we have. So whether it's good or bad, we always want to provide information so people can understand and learn. So with the previous slide, um, I mentioned several different scenarios determining emissions. Um, so here we can communicate hosting a bike to work uh, event, which typically happen in May. Uh, this year it's actually being pushed to September. I'm not sure. Um, how that will all play out. But in any case, we're still going to recommend to safely ride your bike around your neighborhood. Um, but in the past, we've done events where we have, um, you know, bananas and, and different, you know, food next to the, the bike storage location and, and just sort of really trying to push towards that. Um, another one I really like is the emission poster that uh, Energy Star has provided. 
And that I think is really interesting because it just shows the equivalency. So when we talk about emissions, it doesn't make any sense. Remember, it's to a normal person, it's like, what are you talking about? But when you say, we just reduced by X amount, which is equivalent to powering X number of homes or reducing the number of cars off the road, that makes a little more sense. And then another one that I'm proud of is the sustainable leasing flyers that we put together. And we uh, put that on all of our tenant portals. So that way, if the incoming uh, tenant or an existing tenant wants to know what is going on at the property, they have a kind of a roll up of information. So it's our portfolio wide information and then per property. And what, uh, what are we doing that um, to just show the tenant that we care, that we're, we're implementing programs, indoor air quality, water quality, that um, we care about the health. And the other part is elevator signage. It's your friend. You've got a solid 10 seconds to captivate an audience in an elevator screen. So it needs to be direct and quick information. So clearly this is not the, uh, the you know one is the elevator screen. <laughs> but on the left-hand side, we'll just mention that, you know, this is a lead platinum building. It's, it's direct um, or we'll do show the ARC score. And um, that way, you know, just showing that our commitment and that it's consistent and we're not forgetting. And then if there's other events, posters, lobby um, posters will do where we have this did you know. And so we get this information from utilizing ARC, uh, going through that process of, of um, those different categories. We can compile that information and show uh, what, we, what we've got at that property. So, um, and maybe, Again, maybe it's good, maybe it's not. Uh, maybe we increased in our water. And, you know, sometimes it's okay to say that. that it's not always going to be great. It's not always going to be um, the best. But I think the most important is just communicating. So another one um, that we do for a tenant-based engagement is um, a stakeholder engagement piece is um, providing challenges throughout the year. And we typically stick to certain events during the same time every year, uh, providing a calendar of events at the beginning of each year, followed by um, signage and memos and work. <laughs> and this is a way to uh, progress year over year with the Green Office Challenge that so I'm showing here. It's really meant to um, specifically ask tenants what they're doing in their tenant space. And um, they're competing against their fellow tenants. So our, um, what I previously um, somewhat mentioned, our green office program provides various um, simple, low cost uh, strategies that create high efficient green building offices. And so with this, the green tenant guide um, and with this kind of survey slash um, challenge is, is Kind of similar to the lead scorecard from like an existing building where we have the five categories, transportation, energy, materials, um, indoor air quality and innovation. And we basically are giving them a score from two to five stars, maximum 100 points. And it's just a friendly competition. Once we tally up all of the, the information, we give them a certificate um, to the winning tenant and then celebrate their achievement through the most communication in our annual report. And that's uh, something we're always trying out different, different metrics and see what works. So I'd say just to wrap up the ARC portion, um, we utilize ARC as a tool, uh, not only to analyze our emissions uh, through the scope one and two and part of three, but through confirming these properties are operating, operating to their most efficient way as they're designed to. And um, this part couldn't be done without our really amazing engineering staff, I must say, that take care of the buildings and how they operate. Uh, and I, I see ARC as a bridge to our other broader environmental goals with various reporting metrics and help um, we can utilize all those metrics together to make um, a consistent, real, robust um, program. 
and allowing for data uh, to automatically sync from Energy Start into the platform for ARC is pretty great. I really like that feature and it's faster, it has bigger picture. Um, I'd love that with waste one day, um, but waste is so tricky. Um, and then looking deeper into a category, we can find greater information um, for portfolios that we may have not recognized. So maybe those that usage, usage of EV charging stations and bicycles help us to determine if we need more to be installed. Um, so, and if greater communication is needed. So having this sort of um, consistent analysis is really helpful to us. And being a third party, um, um, reviewing the, this being, I'm sorry, the ARC being a third party program is another step to just ensuring that our our data is being checked, um, it's quality controlled, and that helps us to strive to increase um, that, that we know we're making the right direction, our buildings are, are operating um, at their, their best level. And um, I'd say the one last takeaway is that, um, I'd like you to remember, is that um, the path to 100% LEED certified portfolio starts with one building. So anyone can start with one building and uh, build towards a high performance portfolio. So it, it's not a quick step by any means. So just start with that one. And um, Gatsumi asked me what are some, so not necessarily with um, Commonwealth, but um, just as a whole in the market on um, what are we, doing right now? How are we communicating? How are we um, dealing with, with the current situation with COVID? And um, I'd say right now, one cool thing um, that um, we have had uh, is with our EMS program, Aquaport, and we didn't even ask them to do this, but they started providing March 9th uh, which considering a baseline approach, uh, they've been giving us weekly progress reports on um, how the energy consumption is doing. So we've been able to track our property in comparison to other buildings within that region on top of a lumped portfolio wide comparison across the US. And that helps us identify how properties are doing and overall electricity consumption levels. Um, and many went down to, based on, you know, switching to holiday hours uh, after confirming with the tenants um, of the reduction, which is ultimately helps them because um, there's the ones that pay the bill, but um, going through that process. So it's really been an interesting um, analysis week after week to see this. Um, some, I wanted to just provide a little bit of a snapshot as well of areas that we've seen across um, kind of the market on, on what's occurring in one form or another that um, Rodani has pulled together on various optimization strategies um, through this kind of downtime to ensure a clean um, and, you know, ensure cleaning of all those high touch areas as we've all seen based on CDC best practices communicate clearly and calmly um, if a case was reported and the steps to sanitize, adjusting holiday schedule, like I mentioned, based on tenant approval through the lease agreement. Uh, and then, um, and that is being communicated appropriately. Maybe look at automating systems that are as uh, best as possible. Have steps written to ensure um, all can understand uh, the building operating plan as best as uh, they can as part of contingency planning. Look at any equipment that doesn't have, uh, doesn't need to be plugged in, and like a copy machine um, to, you know, further reduce the load that you don't turn off everything. Uh, you, know, you still want your refrigeration for your data centers and such, but, uh, you know, the, the smaller things that you know don't need. And ensure, obviously, that the security understands the new hours and monitor all that. Um, but during that off time, maybe you can paint 
or maybe you can um, do other uh, preventative maintenance that no one else, when no one else is in the building, you can perform those tasks a little bit more efficiently. Um, so that's, those are some things that we saw um, that started happening. But now we're actually moving back to going back to the building. So how can we um, return to work, um, ensure that people are safe? Um, when they return back. So each state, as we've all seen, has a varying amount of regulations. So thinking about the corporate approach to this, um, this can be kind of challenging. So because there's all that conflicting information, we need consistent signage um, across at least, you know, a portfolio that basis showing at all entrances of the building uh, to maintain the same level of consistency. So we do know that we need to maintain social distancing, perhaps encouraging folks to perform staggering office hours. Some come in later, um, some earlier, some on one week, off the next. Um, meetings can be done as a conference call, similar to what we're doing right now. Um, always refer back to the CDC website is probably the best because it's continually changing. So, um, got to me, asked me as a, um, what, what do I want to do when this is over? And I would say probably go to a restaurant would be the first thing, but also to go um, to the dog beach with my dog. He misses it. We miss it. And that would be nice. Um, but right now, we're practicing solidarity and our social distancing. Um, keeping our masks on and, and trying to be positive is the best that we can. But I'll close with this last slide um, that my final point here um, that I want you to take away from is um, I saw this cute little four minute bedtime tale um, recently that I watched on YouTube that referenced an old, the old proverb. We've all most likely heard that hindsight is 2020. And that meaning that it's easy to understand something after it's already happened. So although, you know, us environmentalists have been long shouting from the rooftops to help our environment, um, 2020 is the year that we're starting to um, kind of see the reasons for um, what we need to do um, to help our environment. So distancing ourselves, we've actually maybe learned that taking walks is a lot more enjoyable than driving. And um, we can hear the birds now. So I, I leave with that the commercial real estate um, investors are recognizing that high performance buildings are correlated with superior operational performance. So to lower cost of capital, positive influence on stock prices and reputational value, but the majority of our existing buildings require major efficiency retrofits to reach the highest level of performance. So to capitalize on this opportunity, the building owners, the managers, um, investors are all turning to ESG programs and are getting serious about disclosure. And so I leave you with these uh, seven different trends. Some have been around forever. Some may be new, but maybe we look back at them again and at a new lens and unfog our glasses, so to speak, to see what, what can we do differently. So the first one here is uh, urgency of resilience planning. So this is a larger focus on resilience planning, implementing measures to mitigate and adapt to those risks. And uh, climate change is the top issue uh, raised by investment firms like BlackRock. Um, are asking how they should modify their portfolios on a global scale. Uh, number two is the low carbon economy. Commercial real estate firms need to position themselves for this new normal and to demonstrate the long-term resilience of their business models to investors. We're also starting to see asset owners uniting with um, the UN convening Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance uh, to lead the global industry in, you know, driving our economies towards a carbon neutrality by 2050. And the growth of the high profile net zero commitments um, from big companies is influencing the creation of new certifications that recognize building 
with lower carbon emissions. So like what Living Buildings Challenge and the new Lead Zero certification, those things are, are really good to um, start striving towards. Um, the third one is the urban densification and occupant health. And I say with the recent um, COVID, um, this is prioritizing human health, um, even more urgent. So yeah, dense urban environments can actually speed the spread of disease, but buildings can also serve as barriers to contamination. So we have proper ventilation, filtration, humidity, reduce the spread of pathogens. So that's something to keep an eye on um, for our health and surrounding environment. The fourth would be electrification of everything. Uh, the low carbon economy is, is really linked to global transition away from fossil fuels. This energy transition means significant push for electrification of both buildings and transportation. So again, we're looking at how can we make changes in those areas. Um, the fifth one would be those existing building retrofits. So, I mean, all markets, we go through that normal cycle of um, when we experience a, a downturn. And during the last recession, um, you know, a lot of new construction projects stalled and large real estate portfolio owners focused their attention on reducing operating expenses at their existing assets. So over 98% of our building stock is made up of existing buildings. Um, and 75% of them are over 20 years old. So can we figure it, can we focus on what are some efficiency improvements that we can do now? That's kind of a win-win solution. Um, my sixth one would be getting serious about ESG disclosures. And that's really um, focusing on the quality of, of ESG data and understanding those different types of frameworks that GRES, TCFD, SASB, SDGs, GRI, all of those are um, ways we can communicate our ESG narrative to stakeholders that um, we care about their health um, and the environment. And then the last one is sustainability breaks out of the silo. So that's a comprehensive ESG performance. Um, required beyond just uniquely environmental performance, we should demonstrate uh, attentiveness to social and governance issues such as diversity, health and well-being, corporate citizenship, um, really all departments should be involved. So legal, finance, procurement, communications, um, investor relations. If we have them all part of the ESG strategy um, with these policies and programs, we'll have better performance. So, I leave with that um, this pandemic can be presented as an opportunity for change, and we are a pretty resilient community. 